This one on? Alrighty, good evening, good evening, good evening. How are you? What's up? What's up? Good evening. What a lovely room full of beautiful black people. Good evening. And welcome to Art in Practice. Thank you. My name is Alexandra Mitchell, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Manager of Education and Public Programs at the California African American Museum, where we are the museum in residence here at Art and Practice in Limerick Park. We are so excited that you joined us this evening for In Conversation with Robeson Taj Frazier and Janelle Brown in celebration of our new exhibition, Chaos Theory, the Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell. Yeah, let's give it up. All right. <laughs> Before we begin tonight, I'd like to, um, I need to thank a few very important people. Ebony McLeod, I don't know where Ebony is, probably running around working. Please give it up for Ebony. Paul Mates and Leah Moment, uh, please give them a big round of applause with, uh, yes. Nothing could happen tonight without their hard work and dedication, so I want to thank them. And now onto our program. Born in 1945 in New Mexico. Artist Ben Caldwell came of age within the groundbreaking LA Rebellion film movement of the 1960s to the 1980s, serving in the Vietnam War and studying at the University of California, Los Angeles. In 1984, he opened Chaos Network, the media arts hub that has helped steward Lamarck Park Villages, uh, traditions of black artistry, fellowship, and love for over four decades. Ben couldn't be with us tonight, but we are sending him our best. We are lucky to have his two daughters, Dara Caldwell-Ross, Ross, excuse me, and Elizabeth Caldwell with us this evening. Alrighty, and on to our panelists for this evening. Robeson Tosh Fraser is a writer. U University of Southern California Associate Professor, Arts and Humanities Curator and Emmy, and Los Angeles Press nominated producer of docuseries and documentary film. He is the host and producer of two PBS productions and the author of East, The East is Back, Cold War China, and The Black Radical Imagination, and the award-winning New Yorker Magazine favorite, Chaos Theory, The Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell, which our, our exhibition is largely based upon. Yes. <laughs> He is also the executive director of USC's Institute for Diversity and Empowerment at Annenberg, a media arts and culture driven center that facilitates interdisciplinary education, research, programming, and cultural productions. Janelle Brown is a film curator, programmer, educator, and arts administrator based here in Los Angeles. Her curatorial practice creates frameworks to explore the boundlessness of black life in experimental and nonfiction film and video. She is interested in the space between fugitivity and futurity and elevating the ethic of care with a special interest in the sonic in film, political film and media, and West Indian film and video. Jadel is a board member and programmer for the Los Angeles Film Forum. She is currently on faculty at the California Institute of the Arts and Otis College of the Arts and Design. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Janelle and Todd. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. We're actually going to start just um, in lieu of Ben being here and trying to kind of um, ground us in his voice, ground us in his presence. We're going to play something, and we can talk about it later, but actually let's just play it. it you got to be silent, so um, just do that and let's give it a second. Buddy, before you know what that is, how do you describe light? Color. Feelings, taste. Your position in the universe. Your position with your family. Siblings, the community around you, including the insects, because you pay real place personally attention. Real, real close attention to details as a kid. You watch little ants crawling around, little roaches, little grasshoppers, snakes, lizards, the grains of dirt, the grains of dirt that ants make. The ants look like grains of dirt moving. The kid, me, is laying on 
on the desert floor, staring up at the uh, sky, and your eyes get adjusted, and as it gets adjusted, you're kind of the starlight are almost like laser beams that touch each and every one of your body microbes. And as a child, you feel that as many stars as they are, there's a star for every cell in your body. And it's talking to you from the furthest ends of the horizon. And another portion of your spirit that is dancing past the moon. And another portion of your spirit that is embracing the sun. Another and passing the sun and going into inner galaxies. And all that we have the capacity of doing. But we like the wonderfulness of being here. the home. Spaceship. A massive piece of earth that passes a lot of other massive pieces of They obviously of materials at the most fantastic speed that you could ever imagine. And yet, we're here calmly going through space. I actually want to ask a question to Janelle. First up, I'm happy that we started. Before, I can look before that. Thank you all for coming. Let me just first off speak from a space of gratitude. I'm really excited to see all of you here. Um, I see a, a number of folks uh, who I haven't seen in some time, and that just makes my like lifts my heart and my spirit. And I see a number of folks who have been really, really fundamental and essential in terms of both the 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 show. The exhibition that, that hopefully you either saw or you will see, a lot of people here who are part of that in terms of helping to create it, but as well as a lot of people who are part of the history um, and the work um, that is celebrated and we're, 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 we're honoring in that exhibit. So first off, thank you all for coming. Um, to know, we started with that, those proverbs by my brother Ben Caldwell. Mm -hmm. and. I know those proverbs very well, but before I probably speak to my relationship with them, I'm wondering why, I'm happy that we started with Ben's voice to start the show because obviously Ben is not here and we wanted to, number one, honor his spirit um, and try to center ourselves in relation to his presence as much as we can with his voice. But I'm interested in terms of like, yeah, why? What's your, what do you think, what's your yeah. relationship to those, those well, pieces? One, ben has such a great voice, so um, there's, yeah, there's that, um, it's um, almost an immersive. It's almost immersive. So I think, um, yeah, the fact that he has he as an artist, he is linked to he is so deeply to connected to an aesthetic vision, and which we can talk about in so many different ways. But also the fact that he has such a rich and powerful voice is just this beautiful gift that I think you know. I love that we get to kind of make it part of the show. And so yeah, that the, uh, those were some proverbs 
uh, from Ben, and they act as these kind of sonic interludes between three of his films uh, that you get to watch on the black side of town, AKA the theater in, in the back of the exhibition. So yeah, with Ben not being here, I figured it would be great to kind of ground us, and I also think, um, yeah, just ground us, that's why. Those, uh, those proverbs, uh, or some people, some people call them poems, but Ben has referred to them as proverbs. Um, they were recorded by Ben really during the, the lockdown, during the shutdown of the pandemic. Ben and I, I was, I've been very fortunate um, over the last, goodness, 12 years to be able to interact with, work with, learn with, with Ben. And when we were working on this book, Chaos Theory, uh, the Afrocosmic arc of Ben Caldwell. At one point in the book, it felt like it didn't have enough of just Ben's presence and voice. It was a lot of narrative, and I, I said, Ben, the book needs more of your your voice. And he said, Well, like, what do you mean? And I said, You know, you have an incredible voice. You have an incredible pace at which you speak and how you communicate, how you take your time, how you give people space inside of your space to take their time. And I said, It would be great if, I don't know, you just take, I said, when Ben and I would meet, I would record our conversations with my phone and do voice memo. And I said, Ben, it would be cool if you just take your phone. Ben is up, he's a night owl. He's up very late at night, making things, creating, thinking, watching things. I said, it would be great if you just record yourself. Just travel back into memory and, and describe what it was like being a kid in New Mexico. Describe what it was like, as your mother said, lying out in the desert and looking at the sky, where the environment, nature, was your media. That was your first form of media, was what surrounded you. Like, try to make us understand that feeling. Um, and Ben said, all right, I'll try that. And maybe two weeks later, he gave me this flash drive with about 20, 20 like, these proverbs, um, where he was talking about being a child, where he was talking about his mother, where he was talking about his relationship to the environment and space, where he was traveling back into his memory and trying to speak and think like a child. Um, and so in many ways, those became some of the, the proverbs that we use to organize the book. And I laugh now because I remember at the time, my wife was listening to lots of meditations at night. And I realized, I was like, Ben, you could actually make a career making meditations. <laughs> I said, you actually have another trajectory if you decide to. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, I really appreciate that we started with that. And as well, when you go into the exhibition, you'll see we have some of those proverbs written out to kind of organize some of the spaces inside of the show. Do you want to talk then about just kind of your connection to Ben and how sure. that started? Sure. Um, so I, I, before I met Ben, I had been an admirer of, really an admirer first off of Ben's space. Uh, I didn't grow up in Los Angeles, but I had older cousins who were always introducing me to music throughout the country, especially hip hop. And one of the most important groups they introduced me to um, as, a, as a teen in the 90s was Freestyle Fellowship and later Project Blowed. So I'd always heard, I mean, give them a hand because they're, they're extremely, you know. Um, and, and, and actually, small world. I was reading the work of writers like Sheena Lester and other, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call people out. So just know if I see people Citational who I know. Citation of practice. Citation of practice. So I see folks here who I know are part of the Chaos Network Collective who are here, because they are here. And that's why I say Chaos Network is not simply Ben Caldwell. It's a whole community of people, some of whom are still here with us in the physical, but there are others who are with us in the spiritual who have helped to breathe life into Chaos Network and other spaces, but as well as into people. Right, so yeah, I will be calling folks out. Project Blow was an extremely important collective. Um, I was an MC, or am an MC, and like, for me, they were a, a, a lens and a sound into what was possible. Anyway, that's how I first heard of Chaos Network. Didn't know much about Ben Caldwell, probably until I went to grad school, and got introduced to the LA Rebellion uh, uh, collective of, of, of filmmakers and visual practitioners. My mother had always, actually I'd, I'd been aware of several of their works, but didn't know them as this kind of larger collective. Um, but in any case, once I moved to Los Angeles in 2009, uh, a colleague of mine, Francois Barr, introduced me to Ben. They were working on this, uh, this whole kind of project that was about bringing university and community together to, to talk, number one, and have conversations about if we could remake, redesign the city 
in communities' interests and where the community members were the folks who were leading the conversation about what do they want, what do they desire, what do they want to create, what function and utility would it provide. Um, so in any case, they said, like, let's just bring folks together to talk about these kinds of things. And what emerged out of it is actually the, one of the projects that emerged out of it is the payphone you will see, um, the Sankofa phone you will see inside of the exhibition. And the idea was, what if we took this object, which some of us here grew up with, you know, uh, that we used to, you know, in our cities, and what if we repurposed it in a way that wasn't simply about making a call out, but also listening to the communities members of the neighborhood, where you could hear audio testimonials from residents, where people could go up to the phone and record a poem or a verse, um, where you could hear stories from business owners talking about their businesses and like how they were navigating and negotiating gentrification and the increasing costs of living in the city. Uh, and so yeah, what ended up emerging was this payphone, and there have been several other, several other iterations of it um, that I would encourage you to listen to. You can listen to the stories of formerly incarcerated people talk about the impact of incarceration on themselves, on their family members, and of course, on communities, on neighborhoods. So that's how I first met Ben working on that kind of project. And from the jump, I mean, I'll just be saying, me and him had a great rapport. Like, Ben reminds me of a number of my uncles, um, a lot of men I grew up around. And he was very, very generous with his time with me. Uh, and years later, he reached out to me and said, I, I want to, I have this archive of all these materials, you know, in my space that people have asked me to steward, s stuff that I've recorded. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my stuff. I want to do something that helps to cultivate a legacy for my daughters, for my grandchildren. And he was very clear. He said, I don't want it just to end up at USC or at the Getty, or any of these spaces where people like you <laughs> will be the only ones who get access to it. He said, where everybody only touches it with white gloves on, you know? He said, so I'm trying to figure out what to do next. And I said, all right, well, like, number one, what do you got? <laughs> what do you have? He said, come through, I'll show you more what I have. And anyway, I came through, and I'd been spending time with him before that, but we had one conversation that was two hours long, really about his grandparents, about his grandfather, his mother. And I said, let's have a follow-up. We had a follow-up Thursday. It was a Tuesday, the first one. And we kept doing that for six months. Every Tuesday and Thursday, we'd meet for about two or three hours. He'd show me. He'd tell me about something. I said, I'd love to see that. I'd show up. And he'd have a screen up with a projector. And he'd start sh we'd go through images of you know, his first years in Los Angeles, when his daughters were first born. And then as well, he'd show me photographs of his experiences as a 20-year-old. As a in Vietnam, and he said, these are images I've never really shown to anyone before. So I really knew it was a gift, being able to get that time, you know, with him and him being willing to share in that kind of way. And anyway, six months later, I said, Ben, you should write a book, man. <laughs> you got a lot of incredible stories as well as things of rich history that needs to be shared. And Ben said, well, you're a writer. <laughs> you want to write a book? <laughs> and I said, of course. I said, I'm so excited you asked me to do that. And, and really, we went on this journey that, I mean, it's a long story, I don't, I've already talked long enough, but it ends up with this book, Chaos Theory. Um, and yes, yeah, one of, probably in terms of, one of the things I'm most proud of, you know, beyond my family and my relationships, it's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, both in terms of the work, but even more so, the community I've been able to become a part of in the process of making it, and as well as everything that's extended thereafter, and that's, where we get to our show, because really our show is just that. It's a tribute to community, but it's also something that's a product of community. And we'll get more into like the community that's really created that show, because all of them should be up here, um, because it's really been a product of a lot of people. So anyway, that's long. Thank you. I'll kind of do the same. Not as long, though, probably, but maybe. But sometimes I start talking, and then it becomes long as I get older. But um, uh, you know, I, I came. To, to Ben's work um, from from a film place, and um, so I was introduced to the work of the L Rebellion when I lived in D.C. That helped me figure out that I wanted to do film studies. Moved out here, went to USC, um, met Ben, and so I'd always just come to Chaos and talk to Ben. But because I came from a film place and I'm just thinking of Ben as a filmmaker, he would just be telling me stuff. I'm like, what is he talking about? He's doing all these projects and he's working with X, 
organization and X organization and this organization. I'm like, wait, what? I'm so confused. And like, I think half the time I just, I was still getting situated in LA. I was still getting situated in the arts and still getting situated. I think half the time I wasn't really honestly taking him fully seriously because I didn't know what was going on. I was just like, he was saying all these things. I'm like, what? Uh, you're, and I think, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious simply because I think I was kind of just understanding him as simply a filmmaker. And once I understood that he's so many things more than that, that I could understand um, the kind of multiplicity, the varied tones and identities of his vision, his genius, his, his curiosity. Um, but so, yeah, that's one thing. But I think particularly also with the proverbs that that were just played something else that allowed me to understand um <clears throat> maybe ben and his curiosity but also his eye was one time um that i brought over a younger filmmaker to meet him and she's also from the southwest and i said i think she's from new mexico yeah new mexico or arizona but she's from the southwest i introduced them and once that connection was made of um, being from the Southwest, kind of having this intimate relationship with the night sky, then they just started talking about the night sky for like an hour and a half. Um, and I was like, I don't, I don't, I can't, I don't really understand that language. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in Decatur, Georgia. Um, but it was so beautiful to see, and it also was another kind of layer that I can kind of unlock to, again, understand Ben curiosity, but also understand kind of, um, yeah, just a, a, an example of this very beautiful kind of connection between the environment and between the moving image, and with Ben being someone who has, um, existed as an artist and a person across analog film, video, to up into where we are now. Thinking about him under the night sky in the decades with, when he was a young person. And um, it just becomes this kind of um, expansive arc to think about the way he approaches visuality and the photographic medium and the moving image, right? Um, that's my story. I was trying to find like a little, a nice little way to end it, but Ben. Um, I like ask you. So this, sh as I said, Ben and I worked on the book, but really the the transition from book to exhibit is really a product of like Janelle's kind of vision. Janelle, I think at the point I'm trying to think when it was when we were, I, you had been thinking about a retrospective about Ben's work for some time, but it was really kind of towards the release of the book that you reached out and said, hey, I want to talk about doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could talk a little bit about yeah, like, yeah, how yeah, we went yeah, from yeah. doing something to yeah, yeah. multiple rooms, a lot yeah, of yeah. AV, I mean, you know, like, I would love to hear. Like, yeah. Well, you know, as a lot of things, it comes down to the practical stuff. And or, I really think um, there was something that I was interested in that was maybe um, more just about Ben's films been as a filmmaker and understanding and again I, I was at a point where I understood Ben is more expansive than that but I, I don't have my own institution or my own space and so I was just thinking of something that was a little bit more straightforward and then through change of plans there was there was an opportunity to do something that's I think the more dynamic form in which you see there but yeah so I mean I learned of the I don't know when when exactly I learned of the book but I knew that I knew that, mm, I knew that your Taj, your kind of, I knew that it would be great to, to be able to collaborate with me as kind of a film studies person, a film curator, and you as, yeah, you as a writer and um, deeply knowledgeable about music in a way that like I aspire to be. I knew that there was kind of, you know, a language that we could that we could craft that kind of honored different parts of of who Ben was, um, and I also yeah that's that's really what it was, and I really think I mean again we thought 
initially thought that was going to be something that was just screen based and just more straightforward and then there was more space that we had access to and then it became okay this is going to be about Ben in a way that is kind of that mirrors in some ways the totality of your book which is phenomenal and does kind of I think honor Ben not just as an artist and the many kind of artists that he is but also a person and so having then the space that we have now we're able to think about Ben as a photographer who was really kind of um, expanding his photographic practice as he was fighting in the Vietnam War fighting a, a war he didn't want to fight um, you know been as a person, a young person start, starting to make films, been as someone who becomes a technologist, been who is kind of, you know, creating and thinking at the beginning of the internet, like, you know, telecommunications technologies. So it became something where we were kind of trying to have space for all of those things. Yeah. 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 I think one of the things I, I love too about what we have been able to accomplish also with the with the show is a point that Ben constantly makes when because Ben is for those who know Ben and those who don't well Ben is like he's a lot of things but one of the things he's not he's never about like to shine a light on on on, on me like if you watch some of even some of the footage he has of the different kinds of things that have happened in his space or collaborations he's been a part of. You'll see the camera oftentimes on other folks, but not always on Ben. And I think Ben has been able to kind of, that's one of the things he's been able to do is kind of also be mysterious a bit. Um, and so even with a lot of this stuff, I think Ben's initial reaction is like, whoa, you know, a book, an exhibit. And Ben's response has always been, all right, I'm up for that, but if it doesn't highlight and celebrate the community, I'm not as much for it. I want something that allows not only the light to be shined on me, but be shined on all of these people who have played a role in helping to make whatever this thing is, like make it manifest. Uh, and so I feel like with the exhibit, that's one of the things we also tried, try to highlight, is the fact of, you know, that all of the work is, part, is the product of a village. Um, and, 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 and I don't mean that in any kind of cliche way. We try to highlight that in a very kind of visual way, in a sonic way, but I also keep wanting to emphasize that the exhibit is a product of, of, of a village. There are a lot of different people who played a role in trying to help um, showcase Ben's aesthetic um, and tr try to create an environment that both highlights it that's, that's Ben, but that also, you know, also centers it within that particular space. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's something else we said we want to say? I don't know. I mean, we can... <laughs> well, I think well, really at this point it might yeah. be good. Uh, so since Ben, Ben's not here, but what we, who we wanted to invite actually up to talk also about Ben's work, about Chaos Network, um, about the exhibit, are Ben's daughters, Elizabeth Carwell Ross. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Elizabeth, excuse me. I'm missing it. Dara. I'm, I'm missing it. Dara. Excuse me. Dara Carwell Ross. And Elizabeth Nasway. I'm saying her middle name now. Caldwell, please come on up. Hello. I'm Elizabeth Noseway Caldwell. Um, and hello, everyone. I am Dara Mariama Caldwell Ross. <laughs> um, this has been really exciting to watch it all develop. Um, Dad is here with us. I'm FaceTiming him. And he gets to see all your lovely faces. He's been recognizing people. Um, I think this process has been really exciting to witness. I happened to come to dad's studio while you guys were in a discussion phase um, and it was just exciting to see how the rooms were planning to move us through the different ways that dad's space has moved through time and the different ways that dad holds the community's hand and the community holds dad in so many different ways 
And the really beautiful thing I think about the book, and I think the show has been able to show this as well, is that a lot of people feel like they know dad very intimately in one specific way. And this has been able to give people a more well-rounded view of all the amazing things he's had little tiny hands in. Um, even me, <laughs> honestly, because, you know, I've been on this earth for 30-something years, and apparently my dad's lived a lot longer than that and had a life before me. <laughs> I truly can't imagine it, but my sister is here to tell me it's true. <laughs> But it's been really cool because, um, for me personally, I was able to see the timelines of my dad's life instead of them just being separate things of him as a young father. It was him as a young father, a student, and a man coming back from war and redefining himself in this space. Like, all of those things happening at the same time. And then also those things happening in the same time as life that I'm in now, which is shocking to me because I got to say it's pretty hard. So um, I'm just really excited to see how we've all been able to move through this moment. Yeah. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. So wow. This is really, really powerful. This is just all a powerful experience to have all of you here. Um, I'm Dara, as you guys know, and um, for me, it's been just really nice to have the chaos theory book, for one, like Elizabeth mentions, and for me and Elizabeth, it's always been kind of a task to be able to explain my father. <laughs> it's a little bit of a task. I don't know if you guys can relate, right? But so for us, it's been very helpful in being able to contextualize a lot of the miraculous things that he has done over these years. Um, it's also helped me to contextualize myself in the space and really understanding even who I am and why I decided to become a speech language pathologist um, because I see my father as a master communicator. You know, when you talk about communication from just a micro macro level the micro level is the connections that people make um, but how you make that connection is not just about speech right it's about all of the forms that we connect with one another sound the visuals the resonance the nonverbal the, mm, the you know all of the stuff the gestures right all of those components are elements that my father naturally has grasped. Um, and it's just really nice to see that throughout this life, right, with that connection, we're now, it's resonating, right? It's, it's, it's beyond just this micro, like I understand, but it's, it's expanded beyond through the community that he's touched with these connections, right? And it's the one-on-one -on -one connections and then it's the exponential connections, right? Because of his, his mediums. So it's just beautiful. I mean, that's the whole concept of Sankofa, right? And just the whole embracing our past, analog to digital, all of those things that my father naturally kind of knows is what we are embracing and doing through these wonderful experiences um, and you guys get a chance to see how it all evolved a little bit like Elizabeth was describing in snapshots but it's just really well done so yeah. I'm excited for you all to see it. Oh yeah, um, while you were talking, it just reminded me, my, one of my favorite things is I feel like I'm constantly catching up to my dad in like things he's been telling me and I can finally hear him. And one of the fun things I think about Taj is I feel like you can synthesize dad in a lot of ways in the common language. Because sometimes <laughs> I, I am dyslexic, and when I, I've been trying to like figure out how I read, and I think I read 
in snapshots. I'm not reading a word at a time. And when I ingest the words my father is saying to me, I often have to take it all in at once as like a giant soup. Because if I get bogged down on one word, I will get lost. And so I think that's like been a really fun thing about the Proverbs. That was one of the things that made me cry when I first read the book. It's because, <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm incredibly grateful for the support I always feel when speaking to my father. And for the way in which he can affirm me, even when all I'm saying is, I had a feeling of vibe, and then I thought this. And he's like, mm hmm yes. Yeah, I fully get you. I'm with you. I'm like, yeah, I was feeling it, and then I did this, and then it was great, and I know it's only going to be great from here on out. And he's like, because it is, and that's great. <laughs> and so I really love that, and that's so beautiful. And to have that captured on a page is just, like, kind of magical. And as a person who doesn't love writing and words in that way, for it to be captured is pretty cool. Because I don't, I couldn't do it, but I'm grateful it's been done. Um, also, just, just listening to you, Elizabeth, and talking about how your dad, like, affirms you, I had, um, I was like, Ben is going to be sick of me, but I also had him <laughs> come. I teach at Cal Arts, and um, I uh, do this class in the fall where you just have guests, show their work, talk to them. And um, I had Ben come up in the like first first session, and um, so mm, sometimes I teach classes, like I teach a class on third cinema, and so this is kind of like post-colonial, decolonial cinema of the 60s to 80s, liberation movements. There's some kind of like militant depictions, war, et cetera, et cetera. And I've, I've, I've definitely been very, you know, this moment right now in the world has been really difficult for me. And sometimes I'm like, oh, should I be showing this film? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? Um, this has gunshots, and like even I've kind of become sensitive to things like that. And um, but so so Ben came, and he he was talking a lot about his experience in the Vietnam War, and yeah, so he's talking a lot about war, and he was talking a lot about what it m meant to be someone who did not want to be fighting a war, but was but was fighting a war. Um, and there was something so not cliche and actually just, just very, the way he talks about love and wanting to love people, love the world. There was, I, I'm not saying it the way Ben talks about it because only he can do it, but there was something that was so like, um, soul stirring about it that a lot of these kids in the class and particularly, um, a Palestinian student in my class was just so, um, she was also affirmed in that moment. And I think it was like also a way in which she kind of felt seen. And there was something that really just served her emotionally from just the words he was speaking and how he like very earnestly related to the students in the class that was, it set, it set a tone for the semester, and he did all that work, so I was really glad for that. But it was also just so, it was so important and was so beautiful to see. And I think they also just really felt so affirmed being seen by an elder um, and, and someone that they can kind of take some example from in terms of as students that'll, you know, that are doing what they're trying to do. But it was definitely something that, um, yeah, that I've, that's just stayed with me in the weeks since um, and was beautiful to witness. I'm trying to write. So you brought up that, that, it's a connection between those two points. You talked about my, like my ability to somewhat synthesize. So I'm like, like you, your father has said things sometimes that I'm like, what does he mean? Yes. <laughs> and I'll be honest, sometimes, what is he talking about? Like, what is he? Because he references things that are not in my wheelhouse of just knowledge and information. So I then have to do the search and find out. Oh, that's who he's referring to. Because he's ref he'll mention a name just in conversation and then move on to the next idea, and I might not have context for that name. So I just say my 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 my, my route of figuring out. But you said that, and then you talked about that. I wrote this down because Ben said this to me. 
man, maybe a week ago. Ben was at the, the VA for an appointment, Veteran Affairs the Hospital, and he was talking about just people sitting around him. And he said, he said, Taj, I'm sitting by all of these different people, you know, people my age, people younger than me, um, who are vets, who are soldiers. He said, there, the gentleman next to me who f was in Fallujah, in Baghdad, uh, in, in Vietnam, and he said, this country doesn't know or understand the horrors we're committing around the world. While we're sipping lattes, places are burning. And I thought about that when I saw the images in Gaza yesterday, right? I thought that image, Ben's words came to my mind. Uh, these words came to my mind in terms of thinking about the violence that's happening in Sudan and the Congo. So we talk about Ben's, I mean, both when, when he takes his time which he does, but when he takes his time with you, how the messages he shares will echo. And I truly believe, like, he's, he's like many folks, a vessel, a portal to the echo mm -hmm. of our ancestors, of folks who have been around us, and he creates a space for those echoes to manifest themselves, whether it's through someone I'm seeing, whether it's through that payphone where you can listen to the voice of Horace Tapscott, right? That he creates different kinds of spaces to nurture the creation of that through us, you know, that, that, that these voices, these presences are within, within us, but are we given room and space to actually let them, to let them speak so we can listen and so we can really figure out what is our purpose? What are we supposed to be doing while we're here and who are we supposed to be doing it with? Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you all saying that because that's what immediately came to my mind was that conversation with them. Uh, with that, I think we could open up to Q&A. <laughs> Questions or comments from anyone in, the, in our audience? I just wanted to make a comment. I know Ben. I've known him for a couple of years. I've actually worked with him. I'm making a film about this area, and he's one of the featured, um, you know, cast. So I want to say that Ben is very much, I mean, he's really a person where art, the art and the artist merge. So a lot of times when you listen to him, you have to pay attention to the process. A lot of it is about the process of creating, you know, of throwing a thought or a memory there for you to elaborate. And asking yourself that question, what is he saying, it's very generative. So I just wanted to say that and I'm, I love him. So that's all. Ben was my college professor at CalArts. And I was a young kid from Indiana. And he uh, went to his class. He took me under his wing. And he had Elizabeth in the stroller. And I had Justice in the stroller. So we connected right away. <laughs> so Ben. Phenomenal guy. He took me under his wing, took me to Chaos Network back in the day with the whole Project Blow, the whole music videos that we did, countless of music videos. So I just want to say thank you, Ben, for taking me under your wing. I really appreciate you. I love you. And uh, great book, great show. Uh, thank you all for putting this together. I just wanted to ask a question. This is for everybody uh, on the panel right now. Can you see a distinction between your art pre-Ben and post-Ben, either with working with him directly or when you were exposed to him? Uh, for me, yes. Um, most definitely. I think um, Ben reminded me to be an artist. Ben reminded me to be true to be an artist. I, had, uh, I came to Los Angeles and I came here really because I got a job as a professor and to some degree I kind of put my head down and kind of abided by the rules and conventions and the forms of being a professor. And I got to a point where I just was worn down with that, those conventions. And I had met Ben before that but it was really at that point that Ben like invited me in um, and not into creating anything but just to, just to be free of that. And I think, you know, the book for me, it is a, an expression of that. It's an expression of not, not being bound by the form of what 
a quote unquote history book is supposed to look like or sound like, not being bound by like what a artist monograph is supposed to look like or sound like, not being bound even by what a cultural history is supposed to feel like. That's why we really prioritize like proverbs. Ben was insistent on we need to have QR codes. I don't want people just looking at the stills of my images and my videos. I want them to watch them. I want them to create their own interpretations of them. They don't need to just rely on how you've described it, Taj. Let them create their own descriptions and relationships to those, those works. Um, we wanted the images not only to be in the book, we wanted them to be part of the book. We wanted the archive to be part of the book to help tell, tell the narrative. Um, so yes, to answer your question, very much so. Very much so. It was both being f freed from that, but also returning to a, a sense of self that I had far before entering into those kinds of institutions. You know, like so. People ask me right now about like about about my work, and I said, I said, I feel, I said parts of me feel like I'm 18, 19 again. Like that voice, that voice. I feel like it's coming through the page, and I hear it, and I see it, but it's a more like adult version of it. But it's there, and for me, I love that. It makes the work, the process of it, just feel liberating, you know? And it's not work that's happening by, by myself. It's work that's happening with people. And so, like, even that, it's been a process. You'll ask the people who, like, Ebony, Paul, Leah, Janelle, I probably got on their nerves a whole bunch, but I'll be straightforward. It's been so good for me. It's been so good for my spirit working with these folks, working with black folks, working in the murk. Like, it's been good for my spirit. So I say, yeah. Definitely rocking with Ben. Create spaces for that. And if you, if you don't have that, I'd say get that in your life. Yeah? Yes. Okay, I have a mic here and a mic there. You want to see? Right there. And then, yeah, thank you. Oh, well, I mean, I, I had, wait, but I had an answer, but then I forgot it, but, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Actually, this is where, okay. So with Ben, the kind of uh, folks mentioning how Ben takes his time and how Taj, you're mentioning not really understanding some of the things that Ben was saying because it's kind of outside of your context. I think my answer to that question is that uh, Ben is you know, one of the artists that I know who really, like, activates me. Um, I don't want to just use another phrase, but like I said, the citational practice, I'm not an artist. I'm a curator, a writer, a teacher. Um, and I feel like one of the things I just have to do is um, catalog everything I know and make these connections. And every time I have a conversation with Ben, doesn't matter. Every time I have a conversation with Ben, that citational practice activates and there are all these connections that I didn't know existed that I've been able to make through this like mm -hmm. hour conversation, two hour long conversation. So instead of like a pre-post, it's more that he's someone that kind of allows me to, um, yeah, expand my citational practice and get really excited about it and not feel like it's just this boring thing, but something that is really embodied, something that's really black, something that's really expansive. So, and, and I would just add, that's why Wesley Groves, I don't know if he's here, I remember when I, he refers to Ben as the human internet. So that's why, like, I say, me not, like, Ben, it's a network of ideas, and Ben is encouraging you to go search in many ways because he understands these points of connection so well. So I have something to say about this, even though there was no pre-Ben, <laughs> been all my life. <laughs> but I do have something to say about how he has influenced the way that I kind of have been moving in space, um, being raised by him and my mother as well, who's here, right there. Um, there's my mom, Pam, love her. Um, so both of them, who are major blessings in my life, have especially been integral in that communication component, because I keep on going back to that in speech, my speech therapy background, because to me, that's where everything starts. It really does start with just the connections between people, right? And so he's helped me in my practice, because you mentioned, you educator, I do therapy and work in rehabilitative services, but there's a certain system to it that he's helped me to 
really look outside of and be very creative within a system that sometimes doesn't really allow for that creativity to exist. Not sometimes, but oftentimes. Um, and so he's allowed, he's, he's helped me to know how to navigate in that space and still be a creative person within it. So that's something that I can say for sure I've learned through my father. Okay. Well, um, I was blessed and fortunate to be able to talk to Ben this um, this morning. And again, he couldn't be here, but he, uh, when I told him I was walking around, we had a meeting, and all of a sudden I realized there was something going on at Lemur Park that's not normal. I see pictures all over the place, and Ben's up on banners, and I'm like, Ben, man, you're uh, you're holding out on me. <laughs> <laughs> this man is a uh, is what I call a legend. I've been knowing Ben for about seven years now. I'm also a retired veteran, so when us veterans talk about what happened in the wars and, you know, whether in Vietnam or currently, we can relate. And I think that was something that brought the two of us together. Um, what Ben has always done was put the camera on you and not on him. Uh, he literally came out. I live out in uh, Antelope Valley, and he brought his daughter out. And I'm thinking here, you, you're a powerful person. What are you doing coming to see me? I should come to see you. But he takes time to help you, help you understand. He's been a mentor to me. And uh, I want to thank you all for capturing this. Um, born and raised in Los Angeles. Always knew about Lamert Park. Never knew about Ben Caldwell until I first met him. And I can say, being born and raised here, for all of you, you've got to see the exhibit. It's a representation of him, and not just him, but of the community. I, I got to buy the book, one of the first ones to get the book, Taj, and he autographed it. And so I definitely want to make sure you guys understand if he was here, he wouldn't be talking about him, he'd be talking about the community. And so if you could do something for me, and I know I talked to him on the phone, he's like, Ron, how's it over there? I said, man, it's amazing. If you could capture a picture or a moment and at some point send that picture to anybody that could get to Ben, and Ben, if you're listening, don't, don't beat me up. But this is just magic in the moment and send that out there too. Thank you all for coming. This is amazing to have diversity and this is what Ben would like to see happen. Uh, first off, congratulations. Um, this is an, an excellent exhibit. It's so um, vast and expansive and, and thought provoking. And um, I I, I want to especially say to the folks who helped organize it and all the folks connected, it's so beautiful to honor and celebrate somebody who means so much to everyone while they're still here. So um, kudos uh, for that. So my question um, is about um, the like genesis of him as an artist. If you can speak to if there was something, you know, we're, we're all a collection of many different experiences, so maybe there's not one thing to pinpoint, but a um, uh, question for the daughters to, um, if there's something that like inspired him to be an artist or um, you know, put him on the path. And then secondly, what I, what I love about certain types of people is that they defy different media. Like, you know, Lenny Kravitz, he's a rock star, but he's an interior designer. You know, a medium can't contain people who are just creative. So I'm also curious if you can speak to, you know, how he evolved from one type of um, artistic expression to this, to this, to this, to this. I don't know where the mic Okay, is. I'll start with that. So um, the origins of his art definitely have a lot to do with his grandfather, his, his grandfather. Um, we, we know he was a person who worked as a projectionist in a small community in New Mexico. So New Mexico is another component of his art, just being in New Mexico and being connected to the environment itself and that relation to spirit and universe that happens when you live in communities where you can see stars all around you that we don't see here as much, you know? So that is another element, I think, to his art. You know, it's just that understanding of that connection. Um, 
I think that's how it started. How it evolved has a lot to do with experiences. Um, um, Vietnam and that experience allowed him to really hone in on his art, being able to see in war, still be able to look for love and beauty in those spaces. Um, and I think that was another way that helped him to get through the horrors that he was <laughs> being witness to, you know? Um, that's where the photography and other things came to play. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's more you wanted to speak to on that. Yeah, I would just say it sounds to me from the stories Dad tells that he's always been an artist mm -hmm. and he's always been a person trying to capture different parts of beauty in the world. It sounds like he's been drawing since he was really young and always just trying to develop these skills. And he, to me, especially after seeing the photographs Dad took, while he was in Vietnam, he was already a fully fledged artist when he went into that space. And that is definitely the way he survived. Mm -hmm. Through the book, um, Dad and I were actually able to go to Vietnam, um, which was an insane experience for me to just be holding both things in my body. And so I cannot even imagine how it felt for him. Um, but when he, we, went through places and we went backwards the journey he took and we had a translator with us and we also had Francois Barr um, who Taj spoke about earlier but one of the things dad said to the people we would come in contact to his goal was to look for other artists who were also in Vietnam around his age during that time and they were always conversing just about what it was like to survive and they often found common ground in using art and using finding a beauty in this moment as a way to survive it. And so it just sounds like it was always in dad. Like, honestly, he was always capturing the beauty. Yeah, he's always been a person who could look outside of his space and see worlds that maybe mm -hmm. weren't in And wanting to share them, and too, I think was a really essential piece. Not just wanting to have something beautiful and be able to capture something beautiful, but being able to share with other people the things that were in his brain and expand. Because like, when you look at all those desert photographs and stuff, just thinking about the time that that was happening in and how that was coming out of dad's brain, mm -hmm. coming from a town in New Mexico where his family were the black people, like right. plus, I guess, like two other people. And the, the big, <laughs> Where, like him and boys. his brothers, <laughs> yeah. him and his brothers were the black <laughs> family <laughs> in that neighborhood. Like I that just was. can't imagine. And then he's also like, and now I'm going to show you how beautiful we are in this dirt that y'all think is whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just so in dad. He's just kind of like, oh, let me show you. You're welcome. Yeah. That's very much his beauty. energy. Just beauty. And that that way of being able to showcase that also goes back to grandpa, being able to see mm -hmm. images that were outside of yeah. that pod, right? Right, being able to hang out in the projection mm -hmm. room of a movie theater for free as long as you want it as a young child that is going to expand your brain no matter what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. We just have one more question. Oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember. I knew his grandfather. You know, I knew. I've been to New Mexico. I met Ben when I was like, um, I, what was I, 19 or 20, something like that. And he had just come to New Mexico. He was going to go to, he was trying, he had been working. He said he was in a bean factory working. He says, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. So he went to an art school for painting um, in uh, Phoenix, you know, which is where I lived. And um, so it was like, I had always said this I, thing about I wanted a man who did not center his life around me because I felt like my dad centered his life around my mother and she wasn't a very good goddess. I mean, she was a wonderful woman, but she wasn't a good. <laughs> she wasn't a good god. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, in other words, my dad was too dependent on her, on her approval and my little estimation. So I wanted somebody that was had something going on besides me. You know, and I got it. <laughs> so, you know, then 
name came from people that in New Mexico, they didn't know who he was. They thought he was a nothing, really. And he was always rebelling against who they, that box that they were trying to put him in, you know, mm -hmm. and to express himself beyond that. And, and you, dogs, you guys don't know what he's talking Half the time, I never knew what he was talking about. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm supposed to be really smart. And it's like, what the heck is he talking about? I don't get it. You know, it's okay. <laughs> But he's like a visionary or something. And it's like beyond my understanding, you know, a lot of times. So sometimes, you know, when you don't understand, you tend to go, mm, y'all luck. Mm. <laughs> Where's the reality in this? Because I didn't get it, you know. So, you know, anyway, I'm just really appreciative of everybody, of everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Last comment, uh, I've known Ben since Ben was first in LA. My name is Dale Brockman Davis. And if it wasn't for Ben, we probably as a gallery institution would not have existed. He was a person that always had a lot to say, but whatever it was that he was saying and focused on, you knew it was real, whether you understood it or not, whether you got him to slow down and explain it, that wasn't your job. You had to give him time. And over time, over the years, I've realized the power of Ben Caldwell. And what a wonderful man. Uh, and I'm honored to be here to also help to represent him, even though he's not here standing with us. I'm here in his presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We want to thank every, everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, we hope you all get time, you know, in the next couple months to check out the exhibition. I would like to ask a couple people to come up just so I can thank them personally. Ebony McLeod, can you please come to the stage? Ebony! So I just want to, when I talk about Tuesday. this work is a, really a product of a village. None of this, none of this, none of this would be here if this sister here had not. A vision and understood our vision and it worked to ensure that all of the different pieces all the different elements were able to be so I want to thank Ebene yes. Paul, Paul, Mates. Paul Paul Mate, can you please Paul come Mates. up please can you please come up Paul as well Le Leah moments where are you Leah? Leah Leah are you here Kayla can you come up please Russell Ale Hamilton, Alexandra. Russell Hamilton, Russell Hamilton and Kayla. Russell, they Russell were Hamilton right here. Okay. And also played a key okay, role now. in helping us with our videos and our editing. All right. Casey Anderson, can you please stand up? I know you're stuck. Casey, Casey, a lot of the technology and the interactive media. Tamara Nails, where are you, Tamara? Tamara Nails, come on up, please. Um, as I said, all of the exhibition is a product of so many different people, many of whom are not here. I want to thank them. I want to thank Art and Practice, California African American Museum, and most importantly, Ben Caldwell for entrusting us with doing this show and honoring his work and that of Chaos Network. Thank you all for thank coming. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.